Sometimes all you really need is a tent stake, even if you're not actually pitching a tent. These are something that we have made thousands of here at Black Bear Forge over the years. Not so much anymore, but 15, 20 years ago, this is one of the things that made this a profitable shop instead of just a hobby. Of course, like most projects, prepping the stock, getting it cut to length is one of the most important things. This is some place where the old Edward Shear really pays off. Like I say, we've made thousands of these, probably tens of thousands of these, plus tens of thousands of other projects that that shear has cut. And I paid $100 for that shear used probably 35 years ago. It was one of the first splurges I made. It had forge hammer anvil and a post vise. And that was probably the first thing I bought after that. Before that, I was using abrasive blades on a circular saw, and it really was not a very efficient way to cut. Of course, having a little bit of help goes a long ways, and that makes this project more than just twice as efficient. It's, it's probably three or four times faster, just because you have somebody to help feed the materials through the shear. When doing big production runs on a project like this, sometimes it really helps to rearrange the shop a little bit to better accommodate what the workflow is for that particular project. We used to bring the gas forge over and put it right next to the power hammer when we were working. You could sit in a stool at the power hammer. Unfortunately, with the tank out in the yard, I don't have hoses long enough to move the gas forge everywhere. But the induction forge is pretty easy to move, and it would be pretty simple to put plugs in multiple places in the shop so this could be relocated if that's the kind of work you're doing. The induction forge also has a timer on it, so you can set the heating time, hold time, cooling down time, and you put a bar in there, turn your back on it while you go work on the first bar. So I really wish I had had the induction forge back when we were doing all these things. I think it would have made life just a little bit easier yet again. Now when I first started doing these, I was doing it all by hand at the anvil. It was a time-consuming process, it was tedious, you wore yourself out, and the hourly rate was really terrible. It was one of those things I regretted ever taking the job on because this was going to be a long-term thing for as many as a thousand in a single setting. But I was younger and more naive back then and I took the job way too cheap. As we did more of these we added some equipment to the shop, notably the little giant power hammer and the fly press. The little giant we'd just sit on a stool, we'd have about a dozen of these in the gas forge, you'd pull one out, forge the point under the little giant, put one to replace it in, pull the next one out, and they should all stay hot that way. The only downside was if you screwed up and you had to go to the anvil to straighten one or fix the problem, they started to get too hot to hold on to, so you really had to work efficiently and get through them or they're going to be too hot. Induction forge doesn't do that, so I'm glad to have it for this batch. But once all these have points on them, it's time to let them cool. When we were doing big batches of them and you had a thousand of them in a heap on the floor of the shop, it would take all afternoon to cool. So generally we did all the cutting one day, all the points the next day, and did all the bins in the top the next day. For the dozen I'm doing today, it doesn't take that long for them to cool. But while they cool, I would like to take a moment and thank Combat Abrasives for being a regular sponsor here at Black Bear Forge. It really does make a difference and I appreciate their help so I can bring these videos to you and share my passion for blacksmithing. If you need abrasives for your shop, whether it's grinding belts, flap discs, or hand sanding abrasives, Combat Abrasives can probably take care of you. And there's a link in the video description with a discount code BLACKBEAR10 that'll get you a discount on your order.
Once everything's cool, it's time to address ourselves to the hook. Again, a little bit of rearranging of the shop, bring the forge closer to the fly press, bring another anvil closer to the fly press and the forge, so I've got a real compact little work area. Really makes a much more efficient workflow. I just bevel the ends off so there's not a sharp edge on here for somebody to cut themselves. The tit stake doesn't care, but you don't want anybody to cut themselves with the stuff you send out of the shop. Then we go to the fly press and bend the hook in a jig. This is the same jig I started with. I haven't changed this for thousands and thousands of these tent stakes. Mild seal still works just fine, nothing special. I don't put any finish on these. Anything you put on them is going to get scraped off as they go in and out of the ground. And for the ones I used to make, I suspect people ended up losing them after a year or two, long before they ever got rusty and were a problem. The ones we have around here, I got some of these from those batches way back when that are probably 20 years old, and we still use them for staking out plants or the project we needed stakes for today, which is putting a cage around a little aspen tree so the deer don't eat it down to the roots. I alluded to this not being a very profitable job at the beginning of the video. And without the power hammer, without the fly press, it was miserable work. But making tent stakes and making them in these big batches, selling them wholesale, that wasn't even my retail price, it was a big wholesale customer. One customer is what really financed all this. But the handful of years we were doing these paid for the little giant power hammer, paid for the fly press, paid all the overhead on this and still gave us a better hourly wage to put in our pocket than what we were making when we were doing them by hand. So the investment in bigger tools can make you money if you use them right and if they're really the right tools for the job. As they say, sometimes you gotta spend money to make money, and in this case, it paid off big. These tools are in the shop, they're paid for. I don't have to worry about whether I use them enough anymore. If the fly press sits for a year not being used, it's not a big deal. It's completely paid for and it's there when I need it. And that philosophy pretty much goes for all the big equipment I've got in the shop. It's all paid for, it's all covered, and the work that's come out of those tools has more than paid for the expense of putting them in the shop. Now I'm not saying you should spend money you don't have, but if you're trying to decide whether or not upgrading to a small power hammer or a bigger power hammer from the small power hammer or adding a hydraulic press. Think about how you might use it and whether or not you can do something with that that's gonna pay for that equipment in the long run. In the end, you just have to make the best decision for your situation and your budget. Hope you have time in your day to get out to your shop, make something, stay safe, wear your safety glasses. We'll see you for the next video.